Well, it happens frequently in Christmas movies. You've probably seen it many times yourself. Somebody's in a desperate situation. Maybe they've got a financial disaster going on, or maybe some developer has finagled some way to buy the Christmas tree farm and ruin the look of the town and the traditions of the town. Sounds like Hallmark movies. They're all about something like that. <laughs> um, or there's a broken relationship that seems hopeless and it's right at Christmas time and how awful. And then things turn around somehow, sometimes magically in some of these movies, things turn around and work out for the best. The, the Christmas tree farm is saved or the family farm, the, uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be, the relationship is restored the finances, something comes through and, and they make it through and their ship comes in, whatever it may be. And then comes the familiar line, it's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> that line is used so often, a Christmas miracle. Nancy and I uh, have some, <clears throat> some old uh, vinyl records that Roy and Diane gave us. Uh, and uh, some of them are sets of Christmas music and it's real, you know, it's the old stuff, the good stuff. And, um, and but there's one that's mostly sacred music and it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. It's like a four or five record set. And, uh, but some of it's the more secular things as well in there. And I was noticing one song yesterday said something like Christmas time when every dream comes true, you know? And it's like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, you got like, uh, you know, every person's got at least one dream. Uh, some people have multiple dreams. You start multiplying that around the world, every dream comes true, you wind up with 20 or 30 billion dreams, and they're not all gonna come true <laughs> just because it's Christmas time. And yet, maybe a Christmas miracle, you know, will happen. And that's just a cliche kind of thing that makes it an appearance around this time of season. I, I've mentioned before a screenplay that I've written and I keep entering into uh, screenplay contests and uh, it's, it's a Christmas screenplay and I, I even have a line in there, let me get it exactly right, where uh, there's a desperate character in there who says, I sure could use a Christmas miracle right about now. <laughs> Check out some of these movie titles I came across. Christmas Miracle. Distinguished from A Christmas Miracle. <laughs> Once Upon a Christmas Miracle. And Miracle on Christmas. And on and on and on they go. Hallmark this year is promoting their Christmas movie lineup as Miracles of Christmas 2020. <laughs> So things turn out the way everyone wants, sometimes with Santa's help and some of these movies, and they call it a Christmas miracle because things turned out the way somebody wanted it to or needed it to. Well, let me tell you about a true Christmas miracle, a true Christmas miracle that began in a manger in Bethlehem and unleashed God's miraculous plan to pay for the sins of mankind, to bring a savior into this world, to save us who are unable to save ourselves. As we continue our look in the beginning of Isaiah here at God's indictment on the people of Judah, through Isaiah the prophet. And as we remember that his indictment speaks not only to them, but to us also, as we saw last week, and we will reiterate it again this week, speaks to humanity, the desperate situation in which we all find ourselves as humans. We're going to find that we had no hope apart from a true Christmas miracle. 
Now we're talking about the real stuff. The hand of God. So we're going to find in our text this morning three realities of the human condition that call for a miracle. We could say require a miracle on our behalf. One reality of the human condition that calls for a miracle is our sin. I did it again. Our sin is deep. Our sin is deep. Look at verses 21 to 23. How the faithful city has become a whore. She who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. The faithful city, this would obviously be speaking of Jerusalem, Jerusalem being the capital of Judah, would be representative of the nation of Judah, focusing in on, on the city, but not at the expense of talking about the whole nation, and we could say not at the expense of talking about the whole of humanity, but this city, this had been the place that was the capital of a nation created to the glory of God. I mean, it had been the capital of the United Nation when it was all Israel. And it remained the capital of the southern kingdom when Israel and Judah split off from one another. But now it has become wicked. And remember, just to look at what we looked at last week, we don't just point the finger at them and say, how could they be so wicked after all God did for them? Because this speaks to us as well, as I keep saying. So we have Romans 3.23 we looked at last week. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's in a context where it's talking about it's not just Jews and it's not just Gentiles. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Earlier in that chapter, we read, For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, and Greek is another way to say Gentile, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no not one. None. So, seven billion people on the planet, not one is righteous. Throw in everyone who's ever lived on the planet, not one is righteous. Romans 3, 9 and 10. Of course, we would exclude Jesus from this, but Paul isn't talking about lumping him in with the natural man. None of us are righteous. So we're all in this boat that we're looking at here as Jerusalem is being spoken to. What do we see about man's condition through Jerusalem? He says the faithful city has become a whore. And so that would be, this is God's city, but instead of being a bride to God, the city has welcomed other suitors, shall we say. He says justice and righteousness have moved out and murderers have moved in. And they've become corrupted. He speaks of silver. Your silver has become dross. The dross is the impurities in the silver. Had silver has to be heated up and melted in the and the, drug, the impurities uh, taken off for it to be pure and valuable. But their silver has become impure, or they have become impure silver. 
and they have become wine mixed with water, once again, impure. They're, they're, I think when I read this, I think of uh, Jesus saying that um, a, little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And that's what's going on with these people. Irish Bible scholar J. Alec Mahir described it well. I'm going to read something he said. When commitment to the Lord goes, breaching the first table of the law, and that's the Ten Commandments, you know, two, two tab tablets, breaching the first table of the law, which were the commandments that had to do with man's relationship to God, And that's represented here by harlotry or whoredom, as the ESV uses the word whore. Breaching the first table of the law, the breach of the second table follows. And that's represented by murder. In other words, you, you begin to slip in your devotion to God, and then everything else about righteous living how we treat one another, and so forth, goes by the wayside as well. We're seeing in our nation, we're seeing uh, lawlessness rising rapidly, and response to defund police departments, <laughs> and to make it even worse. I don't want to get political, but I mean, that's just common sense. I mean, come on. But common sense can go by the wayside too when you begin to forsake God. And our nation is forsaking God. And so, other things are beginning to follow. This is not just something we do as humans. It's what we are. It's what we are, because there is none righteous. No, not one. We are like a condemned house. It looks like the wind could come along and just knock it over. We're like a condemned house. Could such a house ever hope to be restored to what it was and to what it was made to be? Well, yes, but it's certainly not going to restore itself, is it? It's going to require the skilled master builders to come in, maybe knock the whole thing down and build something in its place, on its foundation. But it certainly can't fix its own dilapidation. And that's where we find ourselves, thoroughly corrupt and incapable of helping ourselves. That's humanity. That's why the, the, the line in that, uh, that Christmas song of mine that we sang, um, he came to do for us what we're not able. And that's, that's what the salvation that Jesus brings is. It accomplishes what we cannot and could not ever accomplish for ourselves. And so we could say with Paul, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's the situation in which humanity finds itself. So, you have the tin man, and what happened to the tin man? He was chopping wood, and it began to rain, and he began to rust, and then he was frozen in that position, totally incapable of helping himself. There's an oil can right there, but he couldn't do anything about it. So Dorothy comes along, takes the oil can, and begins to uh, put some of it in his joints, and he begins to loosen up, and all of a sudden, the destruction of the rust that was caused by the rain goes away, and he is restored. And so sin corrupts us. Sin can paralyze us spiritually. It leaves us helpless. It leaves us in need of a rescue that's beyond human. 
Another word for that would be a miracle. A miracle. So that's our first reality of the human condition that calls for a miracle. Our sin is deep. Secondly, God's wrath is fierce. So we're in a whole heap of trouble there. Our sin is deep and God's wrath is fierce concerning our sin. Uh, if you look at verse 24, it says, Therefore the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. Now we're going to jump down because the next few verses are part of point number three. We're going to jump down and continue God's wrath showing through here. Pick up at verse 28. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you've chosen. That probably refers to false religions, where they would use oaks and gardens and things like that as part of divine worship of their false gods. That's part of Israel's whoredom as they go after other gods. And even while keeping up the sham of their own phony worship that we looked at last week. And so uh, verse 30, for you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. So he takes this picture of this false worship. The oak is a mighty oak tree, but you know what? They do die and the leaf withers. You're going to be like the mighty oak on its way out. You're going to be like the beautiful garden without water drying up on its way out. And the strong shall become tender and his work a spark. Is that not the most poetic, brilliantly written thing? The strong shall become tender and his work a spark. The very things that the ones who think they're strong apart from God the very things they accomplish will become the sparks that light them and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. That's wrath towards sin. God's wrath is fierce. These people are in a frightening position and they seem to have no idea. And that's true. The world tends to go, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And they tend to ignore things that God sends along to, uh, to cause them to look to him. Maybe we're even doing that with COVID. I don't know that God sent COVID, but COVID certainly is an opportunity to say, wow, we really are having a hard time getting a handle on this thing. Maybe we're not all that. And to begin to look to God, who is all that. And yet, what has man done? Man's turned it into a political football. God's not part of the equation at all. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the CNN anchors uh, even talked about how uh, prayer isn't going to do anything. Uh, back, in the, back in the spring when everyone was going crazy over this thing. So we look at this, and I'd like you to hear this, and then hear it, hear alongside of it what we often say. And I'm not saying this is a wrong thing to say, but I think we say it and we ignore a whole lot of other context that it should be said within, and that is that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. God so loved the world, and so we know he does love sinners, and he sent his son in love, and, he, he, and in love he wants to rescue us, and he sent his son to do that. But we say that so flippantly, like, like, like God is some milquetoast being out there or something who, who, who's, who has no wrath towards sin, who... And, and I think maybe this is why some believers are starting to deny the doctrine of hell. Because the God they've created 
with just a little bit of he, this scripture from here and a little bit of scripture from there, how could he allow anyone to spend eternity suffering? But we have to understand God as he has revealed himself in the scriptures. And so while it is true that God hates the sin and God loves the sinner and since that he has provided in his love the, the, the way of rescue, the way out of their situation, and he moves on their hearts to, uh, to accept that way, which is through Jesus, we need to say something like that in the context of God's wrath towards sin. And not be flippant about it all. Consider these two psalms. These, these are stunning. I mean, people love to say, oh, the psalms, so beautiful, so... The psalms could be <laughs> pretty rough on us sometimes. <laughs> the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. God hates the sin, but not the evildoers. Psalm 5.5 5 would beg to differ. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Psalm 11.5. God is many faceted. He's an infinite being. And we want to bring him down to an understanding that would somehow fit into a finite human context. And then we come across stuff like that. And so we understand that God so loved the world and God is gracious and God is merciful and God is love yes but people still better take care of their sin by having it washed away by the blood of Jesus in this text God views those who reject him and corrupt what is his as enemies he in our text this morning he says I will get relief from my enemies. They're enemies from whom God says he wants relief. And, and then he says, and avenge myself of my foes. He breaks rebels, it says in verse 28. He consumes those who forsake him. He causes shame on those who worship other gods, for they shall be ashamed of the oaks and the gardens, he says in verse 29. And he uses the works of those who think they're strong in and of themselves against them. And so there is a side of God. I don't know if you want to say a side of God, because everything is true of God at the same time. Everything that is an attribute of God. But, you know, you can be like running into a grizzly when her cubs are nearby. I turned the sound down. Oh, well. Let me see if I can go back and get that for you. There you go. That's not a pleasant thought. In fact, it keeps me from camping in many places in this country. <laughs> or even wanting to live there in a house. Now, you can, face, you can face that. And you know people survive that. <laughs> Some don't. But if you've ever been to Yellowstone or a place where they're prevalent, they tell you what to do if you encounter a bear. One thing you do is you ball up on the ground and you cover your head. And if they start batting you around, you just play like you're a ball. You don't get up and run because they can outrun you. You don't climb a tree because they can climb it better than you can. And uh, protect your vitals and, and you may get out alive. But if you confront the wrath of God... There is no safety from that apart from a miracle that comes from his own hand. 
is I mean what what do we what what do I have to offer God to overcome my sin? What does anybody else have to offer God to help me overcome my sin? What does this world have? He made it all. It's all his. So we can't bargain our way out. We have nothing that an infinite God needs. If people want to make bargains with God. It's like, you know, God, I'll give money to this and that. So God doesn't need our money. Money's a human convention. He doesn't need our money. It carries no weight with him. We can't beg our way out. He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. And so that is the reality that humanity finds itself in. How is it then that we find our third reality of the human condition? Because I've really gone as bleak as this passage is for people who at Christmas time are looking for an It's a Wonderful Life message. And it's my favorite movie. I love it. I'm not putting it down. But, but reality is reality. And our sin is deep and God's wrath is fierce but there is hope yet there is hope where does that come from how do we find this reality of the human condition that there is hope God gave Zion hope he, we go back to verse 25 I will turn my hand against you now that sounds like you know you're going to get backhanded across your face or something like some of us might have gotten when we were kids. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross. So God's hand is going to be is, is going to have judgment in it but combined with judgment is going to be purifying them. So see this is like God's love and God's wrath can all go on at the same time. And I will remove all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. <laughs> Zion, and that's another word. That word is used for both the land and for the city in this context. I think it would be the city, but also representing the land. Zion shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. God would redeem them and us. How, how does God redeem by justice? Some of the translations I looked at on this the more modern translations that try to smooth things out and everything almost made it sound like God will redeem those who act justly. And that's works salvation. God, God, Zion shall be redeemed by justice. I'll tell you what the justice is. The justice is the one who would come and would bear our sins on the cross so that they would be paid for, not swept under the rug. God's wrath towards sin, we violated God's law, a price must be paid, and someone paid it for us. So that justice is maintained, the price is paid. It's just like if a judge finds you a million dollars you don't have any way on earth of coming up with a million dollars. And some generous rich person out there pays your million dollars and now your fine is paid. Justice is satisfied and you're free to go. And Jesus has done that for us. He has redeemed us by justice. God would redeem them and us. In other words, he he would pay the purchase price for them. That's what the word redeem means by justice. Great verse on this. I did a paper on this verse in, in seminary. One of my favorite papers I ever did. 1 John 2.2 2. 
He, Jesus, is the propitiation, I'll get to that word in a minute, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Some translations put expiation. Expiation means the removal of sin. Propitiation, as I did my study in the Greek and, and whatnot, I came to the conclusion that propitiation, the traditional way to translate that, is correct. And what propitiation means is to appease wrath, an appeasement of wrath. Satisfaction was made so that the wrath was put aside. And how does that happen? What did he say on the cross? He said a few things. Seven last words of Jesus we hear at Easter time, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of our sin is upon him. Sin over which God has wrath and his son is bearing the wrath causing sin of humanity and he turns away from his son. As he was bearing our sin on the cross, he took the wrath of God for us. He appeased the wrath of God. He served our sentence, and that is justice. Justice was done. Now, view this in light of what we looked at a few minutes ago. You hate all evildoers. His soul hates the wicked. And yet, we see him sending his son to take that upon himself. And now, all of a sudden, these verses don't become something we have to wrestle with, struggle with. And how can it say this about God when John 3.16 said, God so loved the world? And here in his love, not that you know we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son for us. How is that not a contradiction? And no, it's not. What we come to see is that God having this attitude toward sin and those who commit it anyway sends his son on our behalf. It's one thing if he's there, oh, I just love those people so much, I wish they would get it. What am I going to do? I, I'll send my own son, I know. Where he has this mushy kind of love that, that we humans define love as being. And it, I mean, that's, that's almost not, that's almost not anything to wonder over. <laughs> but if this is the way he feels towards sinners, and he saves us anyway, his love just got magnified, magnified. That's a beautiful thing. And so imagine yourself on a boat in a storm far out on an angry sea. Can there be any hope for you? Imagine yourself in a pit with hungry lions with no way out. How could there be any hope? I mean, you're about to be dinner. And for a life that's sinful through and through, and that's each one of us. You might, you might say, well, I'm not simple through and through. I mean, I know a lot of people who are worse than I am. But always remember that Jesus said, when Jesus said things in the Sermon on the Mount, like, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that if a man has lust in his heart, he has committed adultery already. Or, uh, You've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, but I say to you, if you are angry with your brother without cause, you have committed murder. What Jesus is doing there is he's spiritualizing the law. He, he's saying the thoughts and intents of our heart are, are in the sight of God, maybe not in the sight of humanity. In the sight of humanity, it's a lot worse to actually murder somebody than to, than to think you want to murder them. But in the sight of God, it's the same. It's sin. And so, I, I tell you, I think we're hard-pressed to go through 30 seconds of a day <laughs> without sin, if not outwardly, then inwardly. 
uh, even even in moments where we are pouring out our hearts to God and confessing our sin, do you ever in the middle of that say, oh boy, I'm really, really owning my sin here, <laughs> and start to get proud about it? I mean, it, sin has crept in again. <laughs> I went through and through, through and through. And if Isaiah could say, as he does later in this book, that all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags, so the best that we have to offer is filthy, then it is true that we are sinful through and through. So you're on a bo boat in a storm on an angry sea. How can there be any hope? You're in a pit with hungry lions. How could there be any hope? You're sinful through and through. Before the wrath of God, how could there be any hope? And yet we know that Jesus calmed the storm, and God shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was in that situation, and Jesus hung on the cross and took the wrath of God for us. Amen. Our sin was deep. That's coming in a second. Our sin was deep. God's wrath was fierce, and yet there was hope. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. He never was there to say, hey, Emmanuel, it's time for dinner. That's just explaining what he would be. He, on earth in the flesh, was God with us, because he was God in the flesh. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. That's what you call a Christmas miracle. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and thank you for these things. I pray that we would own them. Not only the reality of ourselves, but the reality of what you've done to make us righteous in your own sight. We are creatures who can turn things into trite habits and almost white noise. But this needs to be at the forefront of our hearts and our thinking for all of our days. We thank you, Lord, what you have done for us and what this season means and the opportunity to celebrate when God took on flesh that he might die in our place on the cross and bring redemption to us. We thank you in Jesus' name.